May the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. I get nervous when Jesus talks about judgment. Maybe because I'm afraid that I will not measure up. Maybe because I am afraid of the hubris of being sure that I do. Maybe because every time we eat this bread, I am reminded that I worship a God of transformation, for whom the way things have been is not the only way that they could be. Maybe, be I mean, who am I kidding? Obviously, it's the first one. I don't want to be judged. I don't want to be found wanting. I don't even want temporary fleeting punishment, let alone eternal. I get nervous when Jesus talks about judgment. And yet, I love it, I love it when Jesus talks about justice rolling like a mighty river and everyone swept up in the tumult of it together, justice with all God's people getting what they deserve. As if that's not the exact same thing. Justice and judgment. Power to enact and enforce the world as it should be. Power to make things be as they should be and as they always should have been. So when we talk about the reign of Christ and the kingdom of God, isn't that what we mean? God returning in majesty with power to make all things as they should be. And that day, faith tells us, is coming. Even if here and now, God, who is sovereign ruler over all creation, has limited God's own power. Because God insists and always has on our own free will. My power and yours and his and hers and theirs to make things other than how God would have them. For weeks now, in this section of Matthew's Gospel, we've been giving a, given a series of stories about people who make choices. There is a slave left in charge of his master's household, choosing either to act with integrity and diligence or to beat the other servants, withhold their food from them, and eat it all himself. There's the ten bridesmaids, those who choose to be in a state of constant readiness, and those who do not. There's the parable of the talents, in which three servants all choose what they will do with what has been entrusted to them. And today, all the threads of these parables are tied together in this story about what will happen in the day of God's judgment and God's justice, where the question will not be, what outcome do you choose? Do you want to inherit the kingdom or eternal punishment? Cake or death? <laughs> but rather, what have you already told me? What action did you choose? Not in one moment of choosing, but in an accumulation of moments of choosing, of every moment. With the gift of free will with which you were entrusted, how did you choose? In every moment where you 
either did or did not stand ready to shine a light in the world's darkness? Did you choose to act for the good of the whole household, or did you serve always and only your own needs? Does your free will align with what God has always said is righteous and just? Food for the hungry and water for the thirsty and connection for the lonely and concern for the whole of God's household over selfish gain. Building something together rather than standing apart. When the prophet Ezekiel puts words in God's mouth or when God puts words in the prophet Ezekiel's mouth, he isn't pulling any punches about this. Those sheep that don't just eat, they trample the grass so that nobody else can. They don't just drink, they muddy the water so that everyone else goes thirsty. They get fat by pushing anyone smaller and weaker out of the way. And that is not a part of God's plan. And that's not some imagined otherworldly kingdom. That is life. I've seen that. You've seen that. We are all seeing a reckoning now on a global scale for too much spoiling of the pasture and too much fouling of the water. It is not what God had in mind. Not for any of us. Jesus knows that story very well when he uses the metaphor of sheep and goats in his story about judgment. He knows what he is saying, and his audience knows very well what they are hearing. But take this story, if you can, out of the realm of the pearly gate and the day of judgment, and the weighing of our souls on the scales of eternity. What if this is a story about right here and right now? In this world where we are, where the kingdom of God is constantly breaking in, it is close, it is near you. In the kingdom of God, in the world where the will of Jesus is sovereign, and where love and justice have power to make all things as they should be. And those people whose free will aligns with justice, those who add to the life of the whole instead of tearing it down, those who look to the needs of others and not only to their own, they get to keep doing that. And the ones who freely choose otherwise. Well, what if they don't need some manufactured eternal torment? They can just have exactly what they ask for. The absence of all of those people who would have been inclined to show them any care or concern at all. Undisputed kings and queens of late-stage capitalism. Just without minimum wage workers to exploit and nobody to buy what they're selling. But then imagine what it would be like to engage in any kind of community work at all, knowing that you are in community with others who are willing, in their own ways and to their own abilities, to choose the common good. To just get on with the work with no one to sneer at the foolishness of such an enterprise. No one there looking for loopholes to exploit. I mean, would it be perfect? Probably not. Mistakes get made and good intentions go awry and communication failures abound. Imagine a world in which everyone with whom you were trying to build something in community would 
well and truly acting in good faith. Can you imagine what it might be like to make community with other people who wanted to make community with you? Trying and failing and learning and trying again together. What becomes of the ghosts? Well, I do know this. <laughs> it isn't my call to make. Thank be to God. My friends who have traveled in the Holy Land tell me that even now it isn't easy to tell a sheep from a goat. Sorting them out isn't a job for just anyone. It takes the eyes of skilled shepherds. A good shepherd. And I do know this, that we worship a God of transformation for whom the way things have been is not the only way that they could be. And it is that time of year again where we bring out all our best and our truest stories. And what transformed Ebenezer Scrooge was not the threat of Marley's eternal change. But being confronted with the reality that he had created for himself of his own free will, of living his life alone and dying alone, and generally succeeding at excluding himself from all of the joys that we make possible for one another in community. God, who is sovereign over all creation, insists and always has on our own free will. And God invites us to live in every moment as if we are citizens of a kingdom of justice, where things are as God would have them be. Because that is how we make them with each other and for each other. Food for the hungry and water for the thirsty and connection for the lonely. Concern for the whole of God's household and building something together. And the choice isn't about the world we get to go to someday. It is at least in part about the world we choose to co-create right here and right now with one another and for one another. The God of transformation, rule over my heart and of every part of my life. Guide me as a good shepherd, until what I freely choose aligns with your justice and with your judgment. Thanks be to God.